Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Suspense. The adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Dragnet. And now, Gangbusters. Welcome to the Film Detective Podcast, where we bring you theater of the mind programming from the golden age of radio. I'm your host, Carl Amari. This time, it's a 1950 radio detective episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Edmund O'Brien. Stick around. We'll be right back. As originally conceived, Johnny Dollar was a smart, tough, wisecracking insurance fraud investigator who tossed silver dollar tips to waiters and bellhops. Charles Russell was radio's first Johnny Dollar. And by the fall of 1949, yours truly Johnny Dollar came to CBS radio and chronicled the transcribed adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, the man with the action-packed expense account. For 12 years, it was one of the most popular detective shows on the air, lasting until the final days of network radio drama in 1962. Each story started with a phone call from an insurance executive calling on Dollar to investigate an unusual claim. The investigations usually required him to travel to distant locales and often involved murder. The stories were recounted in flashback as Dollar listed each line item from his expense account. Item one, $3.75 cab fare to the airport. While Dollar was always a friend of the police, he wasn't necessarily a stickler for the strictest interpretation of the law. He was willing to let some things slide to satisfy his own sense of justice, as long as the interests of his employer, the Universal Adjustment Bureau, was protected. Over the years, many actors portrayed Johnny Dollar, including Edmund O'Brien. But in 1955, Bob Bailey took over as the series was switching to a new dynamic format of 75-minute storylines told in five 15-minute installments Monday through Friday. In 1956, CBS retooled the show, which reverted back to a weekly half-hour drama airing on late Sunday afternoons. Bob Bailey continued in the leading role until 1960. In this 1950 radio episode, Dollar is paid a visit from an old girlfriend and a killer seeking revenge. Here's the Henry J. Unger matter, starring Edmund O'Brien on yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar? Yeah, Al Porter at Associated, Johnny. What's up, Cal? You remember the Younger case, about 1945? Henry J. Younger. Your testimony sent him up for a 1 to 10 hitch. Insurance fraud? Yeah, sure, I remember him. They let him out yesterday. He's been noising it about that you're the top of his shopping list. Oh, I've heard that kind of talk before. Well, all I know is he's not here in Hartford visiting grandmother. We'd like to have you on a payroll for a few weeks just for safety's sake. Keep an eye on him for us. Probably the easiest money I've ever taken, Cal. If I remember Mr. Unger... He'll have his eye on me. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you Edmund O'Brien in another transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> To make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Here's a taste treat you can enjoy indoors, outdoors, at work, or at play. The cool, long-lasting mint flavor refreshes you. The smooth, steady chewing helps keep you fresh and alert. Adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Associated Insurance Companies of New England, attention Calvin Porter. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during investigation of the Henry J. Unger matter. 
expense account item one, two dollars and twenty cents, night letter to warden of state penitentiary for dossier on Henry J. Unger. I just hung up and the doorbell rang. Just a second. Hello, Johnny. Eileen. Well, can I come in? Yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, nice place. Been so long, I'd almost forgotten. Oh, I see you got rid of that imitation road dance, the miniature. <laughs> Wasn't your type, anyway. Oh, I must say, you're not being very hospitable. Don't I deserve a drink? Oh, sure. Well, what's the latest? Oh, working as hard as ever. Oh, thanks. I'm sorry if I'm a lousy conversationalist, Eileen, but like you say, it's been a long time. I thought you said you never wanted to see me again. I did, once. But when I got your wire yesterday, I decided that My maybe... wire? I didn't send you any wire. Don't make me seem like a fool, Johnny. I got a wire from you asking me up here this evening. You said you wanted to talk things over. Look, I don't know who's playing a gag on you, Eileen, but I didn't send you a wire. I know how you felt two years ago when we said so long. Well, maybe I was wrong two years ago. I know I made some mistakes and you made some mistakes. Let's but... see that wire. Well, sure. It's right here in my purse. Tonight at 7.30, let's talk things over at my place, love Johnny. I didn't send that. You sure you don't know a few other Johnnies? That was a dirty crap. You like little things like this, don't you, Eileen? You like to write yourself notes, make up stories. You've got an A number one imagination. Well, I went all through that a long time now ago. Now, you listen to me. This is no gag, and it's not my imagination. All right. All right. Let's make things as pleasant as possible, as long as you've come. Fair enough. I thought a lot about you, Johnny. Oh, I'm not apologizing. Really, I'm not. Thinking back. I'm glad it didn't turn out the way we originally planned it. I'd have spent half my life worrying over you. Oh, that's very touching. Especially in light of the fact that every other evening it was somebody else. I told you, Johnny. Yes, that we were going to be pleasant. Oh, that's right. We were going to be pleasant. Oh, you expecting someone? No. Nope. Mr. Dollar... Yes? Maybe you don't recall my face. The name is Unger. Henry J. Unger. Mind if I come in? I'm busy. Ah, oh, yes, I see. Well, we won't take much of your time, will we, Ferdy? A oh, very minimal amount of your time. Mind introducing me to the lady? What do you want, Unger? My name is Henry J. Unger, miss. Well, maybe... Uh, maybe I'd better go, John. No, stick around. Go on, Eileen. I'll see you later. I said stick around... I guess you better stick around. Yeah. She just came over for a visit. I'm going to let her go home. Oh, no. Maybe she'd like to watch the activities. Ferdy, get out the needle. Oh. Now, look, Unger. Oh, you talk, 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 just like someone in insurance. You make so much noise and you don't say anything. How's it coming, Ferdy? Oh, satisfactorily. It's all ready. And they were each having a drink, too. I noticed that. Got the rope? Now, you know I have the rope. That chair will be fine. Sit down, Dollar. What's the angle, Unger? You'll find out. Sit down. Can you work with gloves on, Ferdy? <laughs> sure, sure. I can do it with mittens. And once around. And twice around. Once around. Twice around. Hey, look. What are you going to do? Why don't you let him alone? Uh, it's love, Ferdy. Better go home, Unger. She hasn't anything to do with this. Finished, Ferdy? Uh, Come on, Unger. Ferdy, you finished? One, one more little knot. There. there. All done. And very sturdy, too. All right, Ferdy. Roll up his sleeve. Uh, right. Hey, look. He's got a nice big blue vein right here. You know, it's so hard to find a good, nice, blue, bulgy vein on somebody. Feel, Uncle. Feel, feel. He loves his work, this Ferdy. Used to be a lab technician at some big hospital. Didn't you, Ferdy? Well, that's right, Mr. Unger. It, hold very still, Mr. Dollar, and concentrate on this lovely girl you see standing before you. Hmm? Just uh, conceive of yourself as being a very big man, the President of the United States or something. 
someone with influence. Yes, a great deal of influence. My head was loaded with nails. The warm air clotted my nostrils, and I couldn't breathe. I tried to open my eyes, but no luck. I longed for something bitter and bubbly and cold. It was the worst hangover I'd ever had in my life. I finally forced my eyes open. One of my hands felt heavy, and the other felt light. I turned my head... Painfully. There was a gun in my right fist. On the floor, dried blood. A lot of blood. And a girl named Eileen. remembered the keys hanging in a great silver ring from a wide waist. And she was gone. Empty liquor bottles. Two in the corner, one near the body. I focused my eyes on the gun. It was my own. I sat up and opened the breech. It had been fired. Twice. I looked at my watch. I put it up to my face and I looked at it hard. Ten, twenty. I had been out almost three hours. I went out into the fresh air and it hit me like a slap in the mouth. I almost passed out again. But I took it slow, not breathing too deeply. Expense account item two, one dollar, and I forget how many cents cab fare to the combination home and office of my good friend, old Dr. Norwich. I was still so groggy, I almost fell into the house when he opened the door. Why, Johnny, here, let me take your arm. Oh, I'm a little woozy. That I can see. Here, here, sit down before you fall down. Thanks. Here we are. Look, Doc, I gotta trust you. I... I've just been framed. Look at my right arm. The vein. Uh, it's been punctured. What did they give me? I don't know. I can take a blood sample and lab it up for you. Thanks, Doc. I can't be certain, but my opinion is you've been given a very adult dose of alcohol. Possibly a mixture of 50% alcohol and intravenous fluid. Can I prove it? Did you have a drink? Yeah, one. Well, I'm afraid gastric analysis would show a trace of alcohol. Yeah, but not enough to make me pass out. Well, by now, most of the alcohol would be in the blood whether you drank it or had it pumped into you. So it's a dead end, huh? If it's a frame, Johnny, I'm afraid the evidence I could supply wouldn't be much help to you. You've been radically anesthetized, my friend, but that little round dot on your arm could have been self-inflicted. A good prosecuting attorney could make mincemeat out of your case. Can you at least... Make me solid again? It'll take a few hours, but I can get you on your feet. If you don't mind being treated a little rough. I don't mind anything, Doc, as long as you can get me awake enough to keep myself alive. After a Swiss bath consisting of ice-cold water pressured at the body out of a stout hose plus a potent shot of vitamin B complex and another cup of coffee, I felt almost normal. The throb in my head was gone. In its place was the cold realization that I was wanted for murder. Expense account item three, 50 cents taxi fare to Asylum Street. It was funny going through all the motions of a murderer. I began to feel an edge of guilt creep into me. By the time I hauled myself into the Lost Soul Cafe, I felt as much a part of the place as the tramp at the elbow of the bar. I found an old informant at a front table. Expense account item four, twenty-five dollars strictly for information. Sure, sure. Sit down. Sit down. For that kind of money, sit down. Thanks. Now, what was that question again? Henry J. Younger, Victor. Henry J. Younger. Just on frozen. That's right. Well, twenty-five isn't very much. Twenty-five is my present limit. This isn't too big a case. I could do better on quiz show. Henry J. Unger and his character man, Ferdy. Twenty-five dollars and a shot. 
right. Won't you join me? Oh, I can't look at this stuff. Yeah, I took the cure one. Fistula, what are the same? Henry J. Holmes. Hunger. Well, he hasn't been around long enough for me to know his habits. Just a few weeks. He just got unfrozen, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's what you said. Did I? Oh, yes, so I did. Well, he's been dropping in here every afternoon about... What time is it? Three o'clock. In the afternoon? Yeah, in the afternoon. I've been here a long time. Well, he should be here at any minute. You know, I should stop imbibing. You know why? It isn't really good for you. If you had the treatment I had last night, you'd quit. Oh, wonderful. Give me a temperance lecture. I haven't heard one well in 14 years. The last lady that lectured me, I married. Turned her into a derelict and got rid of her. Give me a temperance lecture. Yeah. Yeah, some other time. I just saw her. Where? See you later, Victor. Thanks. Well, Donna, the police know you're out? I'll sit down and talk it over. I wouldn't stay in one place too long if I were you. It won't be too long. Well, speak your piece. Is this strictly revenge, Younger? Let's put it this way. Five years is a long time. Good thing I learned to behave myself or I'd still be running the prison paper. You're the noisy type, Younger. You'd be the finger man if I so much as stubbed my toe. Correction, I would have been. Now I've got the law doing my dirty work. If you haven't made a mistake. I planned this for five years. You won't find any mistakes. Oh, I thought a lot about you, Dollar, up at the resort. You know, in the years I've been in the insurance game, I've seen you guys come and go by the dozen. They turn you out of the same mold. You flip a few jobs and it gives you a kick and it goes to your head. Then comes that one mistake. They salt you away and it gripes you. The world's to blame. You look around for somebody to take it out on. You talk a lot for a fugitive, Dollar. You're going to sit down over a piece of paper and write out a full confession, Unger. What makes you think so? This. A confession under duress isn't worth very much. It'll be worth a lot to me. For one thing, it'll be the truth. You'll have to prove I held a gun on you. Drop it, Dollar. What? I said drop it. You got the wrong man, Lieutenant. I doubt it, Dollar. You're under arrest for the murder of Eileen Kennedy. <laughs> To make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, full-bodied, real mint flavor cools your mouth, moistens your throat, freshens your taste, and the chewing itself gives you a little lift, helps you keep going at your best. So for real chewing enjoyment that's refreshing and long-lasting, always keep Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. Healthful, delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum will make every day more enjoyable. And now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return you to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, Johnny, it's my duty to warn you that anything you say may be held against you. Have you got a good lawyer? Lieutenant, this is ridiculous. You know I'm not a killer... Do you want a good lawyer? Yeah. Guess I better get one. Call Joseph P. Harris. Numbers in the book. Take care of that, Sergeant. Yeah, it looks bad for you, Johnny. When the DA gets hold of this evidence, he's going to be pretty nasty. You have any contradictory facts? Yeah, sure. I'm innocent. Can you prove it? Oh, come on, Dollar. You're in trouble. It was a beautiful job of framing, Lieutenant. All right, tell me what happened. Eileen Kennedy received a telegram yesterday. It asked her to meet me up at my apartment at 7.30 the next night that I wanted to talk. You two had quite a romance at one time. As yeah, I we had quite a romance, but I didn't send that telegram. Can you prove it? I didn't send the... No. No, I can't prove it. Go on. Well, she got there at 7.30. We had a few words. Fight? Not a fight. Differences of opinion... We weren't up there five minutes when the doorbell rang. It was Unger. He was with a guy he called Ferdy. Well, what happened? Unger pulled a gun on me. He sat me down in the chair, and Ferdy tied me up. Then Ferdy injected alcohol into my vein, enough to make me pass out. He dumped a few bottles around the apartment, probably pouring the liquor down the drain. And when I woke up, 
Eileen was lying dead on the floor next to me. That makes a good story, Dollar. Well, here's the mark on my arm. You can still see it. Yeah. All right, Johnny, now it's my turn. We found Eileen Kennedy in your apartment. There were two bullets on her, one in the abdomen, one in the chest, penetrating the heart at the right ventricle. From my gun? Yeah, the one we took from you when we captured you. Thirty-eight automatic. Lieutenant, the... We found empty liquor bottles around the place. Gastric analysis at autopsy of the girl showed alcohol. Sure, we each had a drink. A drink or many. There was a trace of alcohol. Now, you say you didn't take more than one drink. Can you prove it? Can you prove it? Can you prove it? Can you prove you washed your face this morning? I don't have to, Johnny. Okay, Sergeant, take him to his cell. When his lawyer comes, send him right in. I'll try to remember something that might help me defend you, Johnny. Joe. Joe, I... I I just can't think anymore. My my head's gone around like a pinwheel. You've got to keep yourself under control. Now, you're an investigator. You're used to dealing with things like this. Certainly when it comes to your own life. Yeah, that's just it. <laughs> when it comes to my my own life, I'm tied up in knots. I see. Well, I'll be frank. It'll be a rough one. Are they... Are they still holding Unger? They couldn't hold them. They had no charge against them. Uh-huh. And it looks like the indictment will go through, huh? Yeah, it looks like it. You were terribly drunk, Johnny. Dr. Norwich told me the percentage of alcohol in your blood. You... You think I killed her, don't you? Now, look, Johnny, I'm trying to help you. Forget it, Joe. I'll see you in court. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. This honorable court of Connecticut is now in session pursuant to adjournment. Judge Samuel B. Epstein presiding. Be seated. The state of Connecticut versus John Dollar. We'll waive a jury, Johnny. I think you'll have a better chance. We'll take a jury, Joe. Stark picking. <laughs> Your name, please? David W. Norwich. You're a physician, is that correct? Physician and surgeon. Now, Dr. Norwich, did the defendant, Mr. Dollar, make a visit to you on the night of July 10th last? He did. Would you mind explaining the circumstances of that visit to the jury, Doctor? He was very sick. I had to help him inside. He was so sick. A laboratory analysis of his blood showed him to be under the influence of alcohol. Did the defendant, or did he not show you a spot on his arm where a hypodermic needle had penetrated? He did. And did you, or did you not suggest to him at that time that the alcohol might have been administered by means of a hypodermic needle? I did, but also... That'll be all, Doctor. Not quite all, Doctor. Now, Doctor, you know as well as I do that a little black dot on the underside of the elbow might have been done by an enterprising young investigator such as Mr. Dollar in order to put forth a fairy tale that he was drugged, do you not? I object, Your Honor. The prosecuting attorney is attempting to intimidate the witness and interject his own opinions through the medium of his questions. Yes, Dane. Very well. Doctor, is there any possible way of showing through laboratory tests of one sort or another whether alcohol had been administered by hypodermic or by mouth? Yes, there is. Gastric analysis. And did you perform such a test upon the defendant, Mr. Dollar, at the time of his visit to you, July 10 last? I did. Will you tell the jury what you found, please? I found a trace of alcohol. That will be all, Doctor. Thank you. Your name, please? Rochelle Happerston. You know her, Johnny? Happerston, yeah, where do you live? 1024 and a half Pitkin Street, East Hartford. What relationship did you have to the murdered girl, Miss Kennedy? I was her roommate. How long had you roomed with Miss Kennedy? Oh, about three years. Now, Miss Happerston, did the defendant, Mr. Dollar, ever call on Miss Kennedy? Well, not for the last two years. But prior to two years ago, he did call at her place of residence. Is that not correct? Two years ago, yes. Now, is it not true that Miss Kennedy and Mr. Dollar were about to be married? Yes, that's true, but that was two years ago, too, so far as I know. Just answer the questions, Miss Happerston. Well, you want the truth, don't you? We'll get the truth, Miss Happerston. Now... Were you present when Miss Kennedy received the wire from Mr. Dollar requesting her to meet him at his apartment at 7.30 the night of July 10 last? 
Yes, I was. And what do you remember to be her reaction? Uh, hand me that pad. Well, she was very confused. She said she didn't love him, and she was hoping he wouldn't ask her to start again. And she went to Mr. Dollar's apartment under the impression that there was a chance that he might ask her to get together again? Objection, Your Honor. The witness cannot know what went on in the mind of the deceased. Sustain. Strike the previous question from the record. Proceed. In your opinion... uh, No, let me put it this way. Did Miss Kennedy not say to you only a day before the time that she left for Mr. Dollar's apartment that she was not in love with Dollar and that she hoped he would not ask her to marry him? Yes, she did. That will be all, Miss Happerson. Your name, please. Harvey S. Sawyer. Would you state your occupation? <clears throat> I'm a lieutenant, Homicide Bureau, Hartford Police Department. Lieutenant Sawyer, you were in charge of the Kennedy case, were you not? Yes, I was. You examined Mr. Dollar's apartment following the crime? I did. Did you find empty bottles of whiskey in the apartment? I did. How many? Four. And where were the bottles placed? I only saw three. Well, one was adjacent to the body, two were in one corner of the living room, and one was in the kitchen. Now, is it possible that one or more of those bottles might have been consumed previous to the night of July 10th, the night that Eileen Kennedy was killed? No, sir. Why do you say that, Lieutenant? Well, there were a few drops of liquor in every one of the four bottles. Had the liquor been consumed previous to that night, these drops would have evaporated by the time we got there. Thank you, Lieutenant. Your witness, Mr. Harris. No questions. Looks bad, Johnny. Four. Four bottles. I only saw three. Maybe a plea of guilty. A hypodermic? Uh, what'd you say? Joe. Joe, I've been in the fog. Put me on the stand. I'd advise against it. Put me on the stand, Joe. Your name? Johnny Dollar. Where do you live? 390 Pearl Street, Hartford. I'm going to point out to his your attorney that you don't have to testify. You're aware of that. I am. Now, did you kill Eileen Kennedy? I did not, and I can prove it. Please. Ladies and gentlemen. Please continue, please. Mr. Dollar. Now, there were four empty liquor bottles found in my apartment the night Eileen Kennedy was killed. Get that? Four bottles. One near the body, two in the corner, and the police say they found one in the kitchen. All empty. Lieutenant Sawyer testified that by examining the degree of evaporation in the bottles of the residual whiskey, those bottles had been emptied the night of July 10th and not before. Go on. The medical examiners proved that Miss Kennedy did not have a high percentage of alcohol in her blood. She could not then have consumed as much as a pint of liquor. And the police say even that much is doubtful. Now that means, ladies and gentlemen, that the night of July 10th, I would have had to consume over three and a half quarts of whiskey. I've got to admit that I would have been unconscious long before I reached that point. Order! 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 Proceed, Mr. Dollar. Now, as for the hypodermic needle, assuming I were about to go under from an overdose of alcohol, is it likely that I, who have had no practice at the administration of hypodermics, would have used my left hand to administer a hypodermic to myself and be accurate enough to hit the vein so exactly? Ladies and gentlemen, there's only one man who had a motive to kill Eileen Kennedy. That motive was to get me something he'd been threatening to do for five years. And that's the man, the next witness, the elevator boy in my building saw come up to my apartment the night of Eileen Kennedy's murder. That man is here in this courtroom. His name is Henry J. Younger. Look out, he's making a break for it. Out him, Pete. We got him. You did it, Johnny, you did it. Uh... So the case of the state versus Johnny Dollar became the case of the state versus Henry Unger. Ferdy's confession under fire isn't going to help Unger any. You might sum up my whole case in one sentence. Alcohol and murder don't mix. But I'm not kidding myself. If Unger hadn't got panicky at the mention of the next witness, I might have gotten what he deserved. Just shows what a little nerve, some fast bluff, and somebody else's sense of guilt will do for you. You see, there is no elevator in my building. 
Expense account total, $50.39, and more worry than you've got stockholders. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, to make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. There's lots of cooling, real mint flavor in every stick. And chewing Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert. You feel better, work better, get more fun out of doing things. So indoors, outdoors, wherever you go, keep some healthful, refreshing Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. To make every day more enjoyable... Treat yourself often to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Gum, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dowd and David Ellis, with music composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Edmund O'Brien can soon be seen starring in the Columbia Pictures production, 7-Eleven Ocean Drive. Featured in tonight's cast were Lou Krugman, Gene Bates, Raymond Burr, Sidney Miller, Mary Ship, Parley Bear, Herb Butterfield, and Bill Conrad. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> Makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you've enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum every day. We invite you to join us again next week at the same time when, from Hollywood, Edmund O'Brien returns in another transcribed adventure of... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And that's yours truly, Johnny Dollar, with the Henry J. Unger matter, starring Edmund O'Brien, as originally heard July 20th, 1950. Also heard in the cast, Raymond Burr, William Conrad, and Parley Bear, sponsored by Wrigley's Gum, as heard over CBS. Next time on the Film Detective Podcast, Ozzie Nelson and Harriet Hilliard star in the adventures of Ozzie and Harriet from 1952, so don't miss it. To learn more about this series, visit thefilmdetective.com. See you next time.